Imagine living in a country where hospitals refused to treat you for a stroke because the doctors and nurses assumed you were drunk. Or they refused to treat your young child for epilepsy because they assumed she was on drugs. Well folks, that country is Canada. Stay tuned to hear about a new report that shines a light on the life and death implications of widespread racism against Indigenous peoples in BC's healthcare system. Welcome back, Warriors! In today's video, we'll be looking at some of the alarming findings of the recent report called In Plain Sight, Addressing Indigenous-Specific Racism and Discrimination in BC Healthcare. These findings confirmed what most Indigenous peoples already knew, that racism against Indigenous peoples, especially First Nations, is widespread in BC's healthcare system. The report also contains numerous examples of Indigenous peoples given substandard treatment or no treatment at all in hospitals and healthcare facilities of all kinds. And in some cases, individuals were treated so poorly that they refused to go back for treatment. And this was especially true for Indigenous women. Earlier this week, I posted my Warrior Life podcast interview with the author of BC's report, In Plain Sight, Dr. Mary Ellen Terpel Lafond. Dr. Terpel Lafond was the first First Nations judge appointed to the Provincial Court of Saskatchewan, was the former child and youth advocate in BC, and now is the independent investigator for this report. She was appointed by BC's Minister of Health to conduct a review of racism against Indigenous peoples in BC's healthcare system. She and her Indigenous-led team engaged in four months of investigations, which included talking to 9,000 people from BC, reviewing 185,000 data sets, including more than 900 studies, and logging 600 cases on their 1-800 number and their website. In this video, I'm going to review some of the key findings from her report, but first, I think you should all hear directly from her about the colonial underpinnings of today's substandard healthcare for Indigenous peoples. So the most important thing, like, is the context setting, and I, I know you do so much work in this area in, in your um, advocacy and your, as, a, as an educator and as a leader, Pam. And that is to understand the deeply colonial history of healthcare, right? It was a segregated system with Indian hospitals, just like residential schools were, were you know, a genocidal policy to destroy the Indian child connection to their language and identity. A lot of those kids in those residential schools got sent to the Indian hospitals where they never saw their families with substandard care, the TB hospitals. Then the Indian hospitals themselves, I mean, I had cases during this review where there were people that saw a veterinarian, not even a doctor, because that's what you got during the, in the, the, the Indian affairs pathway of healthcare. So we have to always remember, like in the Indian hospitals, and the people that worked in the Indian hospitals were trained at our number one schools, the universities of Toronto, the UBCs, People didn't just come from nowhere. They were trained there. There were people that did medical experience experiments on indigenous children. There are people that did medical experiments on genetic material from indigenous people without consent, which continues to be like in recent memory, right? Living memory. Uh, in British Columbia, the Indian hospitals, like one of them, which is in Nanaimo, you know, the Sanaimo people, they have like four little postage stamp reserves on one of their little reserves. They have a graveyard with unknown people that died in that hospital that aren't even from their nation. To this day, they're there. We don't even know. The history of the Indian hospital is something, the colonial history is something we've yet to grapple with those records and that experience. So what I found, first of all, was that history of segregated care, meaning less than care because First Nations didn't deserve proper care, is entrenched. And people in our system, their parents or grandparents may have worked in that system or gone to schools that just normed, well, you're gonna work in the Indian hospital. Like, you know, so I just have to always talk about where do we come in? We come in through this lens of colonialism, eradication of indigenous people or less treatment. Like it's so entrenched. So 
people say, oh, that's in the past, or like they used to say about residential school, just get over it. Although maybe some conservative leaders still say that. You should just get over it. I'm like, uh, sorry, we can't just get over something that caused these barriers. So that's the first piece I would say, Pam. I'll make sure to post the link to that entire interview so you can watch the whole thing. In her report, Dr. Terpelifon made five primary findings. One, that there was widespread indigenous specific stereotyping, racism and discrimination that exists in the BC healthcare system. And that includes big hospitals, small hospitals and healthcare facilities in both large urban areas and smaller rural areas. Number two, racism limits access to medical treatment and negatively affects the health and wellness of indigenous peoples in BC. The many reports of people being denied treatment under the assumption that they were drunk or drug seeking shows the direct impact that racism can have on the health outcomes of indigenous peoples. Number three, Indigenous women and girls are disproportionately impacted by Indigenous specific racism in the healthcare system. Dr. Terpel Lafond explained that Indigenous women were treated very poorly with racist and sexist comments made to them during treatment, leaving some of them not even wanting to be treated at all. Number four, Current public health emergencies magnify racism and vulnerabilities and disproportionately impact Indigenous peoples. Think about it. Indigenous peoples who already have poor health conditions due to racist laws, policies and practices, who receive substandard health treatment, if at all, and now add the opioid crisis or the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic and you can see how serious this issue is. Number five, Indigenous healthcare workers also face racism and discrimination in their own work environments. While solutions often point to having more Indigenous peoples in the healthcare system as doctors, nurses, staff, and other supports, that's not going to work if racism keeps them out of healthcare or makes them less effective at their jobs because they themselves face racism from their medical colleagues. And I have to stress, this is not about a few bad apples. 84% of those who participated in this investigation reported discrimination in BC healthcare. And incredibly, 13% of BC healthcare workers actually made racist comments when responding to the survey for the report about whether or not there was racism in healthcare. They didn't even hide their racist views. That's how ingrained racism is. Dr. Terpelifon explained that talking about this can be very triggering for the many Indigenous peoples who've experienced this kind of racism in healthcare, and they've made a point of providing supports for those who need to reach out. However, she also made the point that racism does such significant damage that it has to be named, it has to be talked about in order for us to address it. It's really about shining a light on the racism and throwing it back on the healthcare system and the administrators to deal with it. That shouldn't be our burden to bear. The report also notes the most common racist stereotypes held by healthcare workers about Indigenous peoples, especially First Nations. That they are less worthy of care, that their drinkers are alcoholics, that they're drug seekers, bad parents, they're frequent flyers and misuse the health system, they're less capable and they're unfairly advantaged. She said that these kinds of racist stereotypes have real life impacts. They lead to real harm and even death for indigenous peoples in a wide variety of ways like unacceptable personal interactions and racist comments, long wait times or the denial of service, lack of communication or shunning indigenous patients, not believing or minimizing the health concerns of indigenous peoples, accusing them of faking their symptoms, inappropriate or no pain management under the assumption that they're drug seeking, rough treatment and manhandling and in some cases causing physical harm to the indigenous patients, medical mistakes and misdiagnosis, assuming patients are drunk and ignoring critical underlying conditions, and a lack of respect for cultural protocols, being intolerant of families or ceremony.
this report should be a real concern for BC, but before anyone does a sigh of relief thinking it's only in BC, think again. Anti-Indigenous racism in healthcare is rampant in other provinces as well. It was only weeks ago that Quebec came under fire when the video was released of nurses saying racist and hateful comments to Joyce Echequan before she died in the hospital. This reflecting a long-standing pattern of racism confirmed by many Indigenous peoples in Quebec. And don't forget the Brian Sinclair inquiry in Manitoba, which documented how the hospital staff ignored Brian, a double amputee confined to a wheelchair. They ignored him for 34 hours until he subsequently died of a treatable urinary tract infection. And sadly, these cases are not the exception. Whether it is the Royal Commission in 1996, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2015, or the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls in 2019. Many reports and public inquiries have raised the alarm both on the crisis level health conditions in many Indigenous families and communities and on the barriers to wellness that stem from racism against Indigenous people in the healthcare system. We are not talking about political correctness here. We are talking about basic human rights. Racism in healthcare is a matter of life and death for Indigenous peoples and needs urgent action. This is literally part of the ongoing genocide that the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls talked about in their report. Equally important to her findings about all the problems in BC's healthcare system are her 24 recommendations about how to move forward. And that includes first and foremost confronting head on the colonial legacy of anti-Indigenous racism in all of BC's healthcare system. She's also recommended that the government appoint a specific task force, an ADM, to make sure that this work moves forward. I encourage all of you to read the report, look at the recommendations, and then do your part to push governments. I think it was important for the BC government to undertake this investigation and accept the findings. For BC's part, the Minister of Health, Adrian Dix, apologized for the widespread racism and said, Racism has made BC's healthcare system an unsafe place for many Indigenous peoples to access services and the care they need. He also committed to appoint an ADM to lead a task force to implement the recommendations, including legislative and policy changes. It's yet to be seen whether this will be done, as we have libraries full of reports, commissions and inquiries gathering dust on shelves where the most substantive and impactful recommendations have never been implemented. But we will continue to push for accountability in healthcare in BC and in fact all over Canada. We must all keep in mind that healthcare and the right to life are basic human rights, which are also Indigenous rights. Canada has the wealth and the power to make the changes that are needed. But we know governments won't act unless they are pushed and that's where you all come in. Please share this video, the podcast, and the report far and wide and call on governments, hospitals, and medical associations to do better. It's the law. Thank you all for watching, listening, sharing, and taking action. Links to the report and my extended interview with Dr. Jerpel Lafon will be shared below. Till next time, stay alert, warriors.